Clock is slow. It's 1.30, so we'll get started. If you guys get a headache looking at the flickering screen, pull in the slides from that URL if you want to look at them on your own laptop. Um, I can't quite read the screen. <laughs> is, yes, it's a problem. Can I fix that? Yes, and then it gets locked. <laughs> the URL, oh, that's even better. Uh, Trading.pro.com slash all caps YAPC, Y-A-P-C, 2012, slash all lowercase U-P-R dot HTML. Um, that's probably not even any easier to see. Does that help us find the domain? You recommended that talk, but uh, that link <coughs> that's involved in there, but it would help your system with the page. He's rearranged the page since I looked at it. Let me look at the, what it is now, and I can go. Um. If you don't have, I mean, if you don't have, as long as you have the, um, I've done a, a thing, a bad thing in this presentation because the font that I'm using, if I don't, so HTML sucks for anything like typography. You know this. Um, so the font I'm using has, you're supposed to automatically select the, um, the ligatures in the font. And if you use InDesign or anything reasonable, it will do that. You don't have to mess with it. But HTML, of course, doesn't. And if, so you get letters that collide and look bad. So I manually selected the stupid um, Unicode legacy ligatures so that it does the right thing in the font. But if you don't have a font with legacy ligatures, now you're screwed again. So, Okay, so what are we going to talk about? We will be talking mostly about pattern matching uh, in Perl and how it relates to Unicode. Um, there is no next talk. I'm going... I first gave this um, at OSCON last year, and I've updated it a little bit, but there is no next talk. We are not going to talk about, we're only going to do really simple regular expressions here. We're not going to do fancy stuff like that one. Um, that's a regular expression that decides whether you are looking at a reducible fraction, like 12 slash 48 is reducible to one quarter, right? That that pattern decides that. We won't be doing any fun things like that in this class. Um, a little bit of setup when you're working with Unicode. Uh, at the top of your program, you're going to want to say use UTF-8 to say that the program literals are actually encoded in UTF-8. Um, and I strongly suggest that you always say what version of Perl that you have written, that the code you have just written is known to run correctly on. Um, so you know, do a Perl-V, see what you're running, and put a use that version so that next time when somebody comes along, they'll uh, not be quite so surprised. <clears throat> there is a char names pragma that you don't need to use starting in 5.16 um, if you are content with use char names full and short. Um, and that's so that your backslash capital N works with Unicode names. 
to deal with encoded input and output, you can put a use open pragma in your program. Uh, be warned that use auto die and use open do not play well together. Um, I forget the exact failure mode, but it's just not usable. I think it, it you either you only get one of the two things, and it doesn't matter the order you put them in. I think you do still get the auto die, but you no longer get an encoding layer, which is of no use. And the other one, the other direction is not much use either. Um, Another thing you can do, there is a uni Perl Unicode environment variable that if you set, it um, will automatically, uh, with an A, capital A, it means automatically decode your argv uh, as UTF-8. Capital S is the same as saying use open colon UTF-8 colon STD. And the often forgotten or little known aspect of use open is that when you say use open it also affects your backtick stuff that will also be automatically decoded as UTF-8. <laughs> so here's a little sample of the kind of setup you would do if you're doing a simple Unix filter program. So read from standard in or RV. Everything comes in, do something with it, send it back out again. <clears throat> As we'll discuss in just a couple seconds, you can have strings that are not binary identical, but are considered canonically equivalent, is what it's called, in Unicode. So in order not to go nuts, uh, we you should pick a normalization form, and I, I, for good reason, suggest NFD, but just pick one. And when it comes in, no matter, always normalize it to one particular normalization form. Because otherwise, you aren't going to be able to write regular expressions, or you won't want to, um, if you don't know the normalization form. Uh, because more things support NFC, Browsers, fonts, blah, blah. Um, it's probably a good idea to put it into an FC on the way out. Yes, it takes time to do this. But if you, if it didn't matter whether it was correct, I can make it as fast as you want. It's not that slow. Oh, let's make this easier to read. I, can I? Obviously, I didn't develop a slides this resolution. I just did. It. Oh well. Um, all right. So, in Unicode, a user visible character may occupy several different code points, numeric characters. Um, so, for example. <laughs> This guy right here, which is an O with a tilde stacked on top of it, um, with a macron, a straight line, stacked on top of that. I mean, it's one user visible character. It's got three different pieces. So how that comes into your program can vary a great deal. It might come in as a single code point um, 2-2-D, then you'd only get one. It might come in as three code points. It might even come in as two code points because hex F5 is a precomposed O with the tilde. And then 304 means add the macron. Whereas 6F is the O, 303 is add the tilde of 304 is add the macron. So you might have one, two, or three code points coming in, but it's just one user character, one graphene. 
Um, if you don't normalize, you need to figure out a way of matching any of those. Because dot in the regular expression library will only match a single code point. We have a special escape called backslash capital X, which is specifically made for um, this sort of situation. So backslash X would match any of those three versions of that same glyph. Um, so backslash X mat matches a grapheme cluster, which for the most part means a base character with any um, number, including zero, diacritics added to it. Um, originally, we used a definition for a grapheme, which was that little incantation there, which says a non-combining mark followed by any number of combining marks. Do not use that because you get nonsense things going on. Uh, for example, that technically matches a line feed followed by a combining tilde, which is nonsense. Um, whereas backslash x knows better than to do silly things like that. So these normalization functions are in the uh, standard library Unicode normalize. And it, so if you just say use Unicode normalize, you'll get NFD and NFC. There are another pair of functions. So NFD is canonical decomposition. And so is NFC, except NFC is then followed by canonical composition. The K in these two functions stands for compatibility. And I don't know what language it's in, but they already use C, so they have to use another letter. And the compatibility decompositions uh, take care of things like a, the, three, the code point that means three quarters. When you do a compatibility decomposition on it, you get three then a slash, then a four. Um, if you have superscripts or subscripts, those get flattened out to your baseline character. So for the most part, you can trade back and forth between NFC and F NFD, and you won't lose any information. Um, please don't bring up singletons. Um, but with the compatibility forms, you do. Because if you flatten out 20 with superscript TH into 20TH, you can't, after you've done KD, you can't do KC and it puts it back with the superscripts again. It wouldn't know to do that. So there are times that the compatibility things are useful. In general, they are useful for searching so that you don't have to be sensitive to which version of something is in there. Just be aware that it does lose information and you won't be able to get it back again. Um, Python, when it reads in uh, Python source that's marked to be UTF-8 encoded, they send everything through NFKC. Um, Perl does none of that. When you, say UTF, when you say use UTF-8, you can put Unicode in your UTF-8 Unicode in your script or your module, whatever. No, no normalization is enforced. So it's up to you to be smart enough to be consistent. Because otherwise, things won't be the same between files. Yes? Does this mean you could uh, name two different variables whose names yeah. are Yes, it may, yes, that's what it means. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, so maybe different variables with the same name. They would look the same. same. The same apparent right. name. <laughs> Just the different they would be canonically equivalent in their names. And Perl does not respect canonically equivalents. <laughs> <laughs> 
Should it? Probably. Um, so if you're in VI, you say colon, uh, what, percent pipe NFD. And it will run the whole thing through some, or NFC, you just pick one. But when it shows one you pick, you have to do the same with all your files. Otherwise, two variables you think are the same between files won't be. Right. One reason you might not want to do that is because in a regular expression, you might want to match something that is only the NFD form or only the NFC form. So if you ought, if it automatically did that, you, it, you wouldn't, you would be unhappy there. Oh yeah. So the funny math letters that you're not supposed to use for regular text um, turn into regular text. Okay. So here's an example of at least one graphing, maybe several. Uh, so the glyph that you're looking at in, in the glyph column is what's on your screen. And as you see, there's just no difference between one and two. You cannot look at it and know the difference. Um, now, what about the rest of them? Um, three and Okay, you gotta stand really close. Three, four, and five have the math run on top. Five and six have the tilde on top. And that actually, those are different. So we have three sets of graphings here. This one, these three, and these two. And both of these are canonically equivalent to each other. All three of these are canonically equivalent to each other. And both of those are canonically equivalent to each other. And the check marks tell you whether some, whether as written, these literals are in either NFD or NFC. The interesting one perhaps is this one, which is in neither. So don't, you can get perfectly legal glyphs that are not normalized. But that's neither normalization for. And the amount, the number of code points these can pick up vary between one and three. How do you, you know, how would you write a regular expression to match any of three, four, or five? Uh. So let's say you did. Everything you read in, you enforced NFD on. If you did that, then number one and two will show up as two. Three, four, five, they'll all show up as five. And six and seven, they'll all show up as, seven, as six. Uh, and yes, the number four, the middle one, is, is in neither normalization form. Just always normalize. So how do you write regexes to match these things? Well, the, here's the easy one. Okay. Caret O. Which of those seven are matched by caret O? There's, a, there's an O. There's an O. There's an O. You wouldn't get any of those guys. That's why you always put it into NFD on the way in. So to match a grapheme, which is an O base letter with any combining marks. You know, if you haven't done a decomposition on it, how are you going to do that? That's why you want to always decompose it on the way in so you can match things. Um, o with combining tilde. Well, that will get the first five, but we'll miss six and seven. Now, this is very interesting. 
Um, because these bottom two, you might think that those are O's with combining tildes and macrons. And they are, except um, when they're canonically decomposed, you've got first the O, then the macron, then the tilde. All these canonical things will reorder your diacritics. And uh, if they're the, if they go on the same place on the letter. So all the ones that go on top do not, uh, they don't get reordered. So if you say first a macron and then a tilde versus first a tilde and then a macron, those are two different graphemes. But if you said, I want a tilde and I want a sedile underneath, well, that attaches at the bottom versus one attaching at the top. Now it doesn't, now somebody could give those to you and they'd specify the marks in different orders. When you canonicalize it, it will order them, the combining marks, because they're in different classes. But if they go on the same place on the letter, it does matter what order the code points occur in, because you, the way it's supposed to be laid out is they're supposed to stack up differently. So this says, find me uh, something starts with an O that might have some combining marks, I don't know, but does have, what's backslash X? I don't know how that happened. <laughs> Those should be backslash capital N's. Uh, backslash capital N combining tilde. So that way you don't care if there are other marks between your tilde and your base character. Um, again, this, this is just a stab. It, it gets hard after this. Um, like, I probably shouldn't have said combining mark. I probably should have said graphing extend. It's just so much easier to write backslash PM than... Um, backslash p curly brace grapheme underscore extend. But I so always can always decompose on the way in or you won't even be able to do these things. Why are you doing this? Because you want to match in my earlier talk I had ex an example of looking for the word canon, C-A-N-O-N, -N, in English text. There's also a word canyon, spelled not with a Y, but in the original Spanish way, with a tilde. Um, I have family who live in Canyon City, Colorado, and to the great frustration of Washington, D.C., in Colorado, we spell that with a tilde. Um, so the reason you need to know how to do this, one reason is you're trying to match things with or without accents. Maybe you would want to do that. Maybe you know a Renee who spells her name with an accent on, on her E, and you know another Renee who doesn't. And you, you don't know how somebody entered it. So you want to match either way. So you want to be accent tolerant. So to do that, you need to first decompose it so it's not an E with an accent, it's an E with a combining accent. So now you can say, yes, I really want to match the E, and then you can apply a question mark operator, a maybe operator on your regex, say maybe I'd like an accent, for example. Well, that will get tedious if you start having to do all this stuff all the time. Although you can do that. Um, Another way to do accent insensitive matching, now I'm using the word match in a loose way, but I'm not using loose in a loose way. Um, <laughs> the Unicode collate module, which in other talks I talk about more, but I won't do too much in this one, has 
some stringy functions in it. So it has an index method that works like Perl's index function. So it looks for a substring within a string. The thing about the collator objects is when you instantiate, when you call a constructor, you can specify how to do comparisons. And this incantation where I set the level to one and the normalization to undef only applies the primary strength comparison in this multi-level um, sort. Uh, the UCA, the unit collision algorithm, is a multi-level sort. So if the first level is the same, then it checks the second. If the second is the same, it checks the third. And you can actually have as many as you want there. Um, by saying stop at level one, it says only check that say they are the same letter. So primary strength is the same letter. <coughs> Secondary strength means, and they have the same accent marks. So if you set the level only to one, we only care about letters. It doesn't matter which accent marks you got used. So down here with Gabriel Garcia Marquez, who's got a, 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 an accent, he's got a tilde on it. He's got a stress mark on the, the Garcia and on the Mar. So I'm looking for, oh, so level three is case sensitivity. So if you only do level one, you don't, that checks if it's the same letter. You haven't gotten to level three, which is checking whether the case is the same. So level one is accent insensitive and case insensitive. And no, you may, do not get to have case sensitive, but accent insensitive, because it, it's just that way. So I'm looking for all cap MAR in Gabriel Garcia Martins, and it finds MA accent R. So you're in, it's not a regex search, it's just an index search, but it is accent insensitive without destroying your original text. Um, the Unicode collate locale module, the only difference is the constructor accepts an additional argument, which is one of, I don't know, 37 or so different possible locales. Um, one of the weirdness, there, so there's a, DE is German, ES, did I use ES back here, I hope? No, I didn't go there. Uh, is Spanish. Um, there's also ES underscore, double underscore, traditional, so that chocolate comes after color instead of the other way around. German also has its own special one. And in German phone book, so bef in German, if you can't find your umlaut, you can write the letter E after the letter. So when somebody looks something up in a phone book, they shouldn't have to know whether it's Sanger with an A with a diaresis with an umlaut or whether somebody wrote an AE. So here I'm looking for M-U-E-S-S in this string. And under German phone book rules, it found a presumably three uh, collator, the collator comparisons don't care about normalization. They do the right thing no matter what. But let's just say that's NFC. It would be three code points. So I looked for M, capital M-U-E-S-S, -S, and it found M-U-Umlaut uh, uh, sharp S. So you can, this is another way of doing matching. It's not regexes. It is um, more locale friendly. Uh, not all, so you can specify locales that it doesn't actually make a difference with. Like there's no difference between the EN locale and the default collation. Um, uh, 
I'm just going to avoid talking any more about collision stuff. So Pearl's regexes are set up. They were, you know, they were taken from Grep and Sev originally. And you guys are already aware that that means that when you apply them to multi-line strings, to a string that's got new lines in it, sometimes stuff doesn't work quite the way you want it to. So, for example, the dot, you would think it means match any one thing, except uh, it doesn't. Normally, dot matches anything that's not a new line. Um, we have a new escape that means backslash, backslash capital N, which is another way of saying not a new line. Since backslash N is a new line, then cap N is not a new line. Uh, now you can use a slash S on your pattern, so dot also matches a line feed. What you cannot do, though, is do anything that will cause dot to match or fail to match a Unicode line break sequence. Unicode has other line break characters than just the line feed. Carriage return counts. A carriage return and the line feed counts as a single graphic, which is a line break graphic. And there are others. Uh, control L, form feed. Um, the backslash little v escape is a new regex thing which says match any single code point, not a graphing, with uh, the Unicode vertical space property. And the capital version is something that doesn't happen. So backslash capital V is anything that does not have the vertical space property. Um, Backslash capital X would match any graphing which includes those. But if you're used to dot and you've got Unicode line breaks, things get weird. We have a backslash capital R, which it was put in to deal with this. Backslash capital R always matches a Unicode line break graphing, not necessarily a code point. So it'll match a character and line feed pair. Um, so backslash capital R is the same as saying a carriage turn and a line feed or else something with the vertical space property. In specific, as of 6.1, it matches all those things. So, okay, we've got a way to match Unicode line breaks. We can use backslash capital R. Well, that makes you start rewriting simple things like foo dollar to be foo maybe a backslash r at the end of the string. And that's just ugly. And if you think that's ugly, think about caret foo. Um, caret foo slash m means find a foo either at the beginning of the, the string or anywhere immediately following a line feed. Well, how do you make it immediately following a line break? You can't use backslash r in a look behind because it's variable width. <clears throat> so you say it's either the start of the string behind me or it's a vertical white space behind me, and then it's a foo. That's ridiculous. So this is what I do. Yes, it's destructive, but life's too short. So I just change all the Unicode line breaks graphemes into new lines, and then I just keep on going. Uh, I wish there were an input filter that did this. I mean, yes, you can write one, but there's no line discipline. It's not what we call it anymore. What, an I.O. what? Layer. An I, that's right. It's, it's, there's, um, no I.O. layer that automatically does these things for you. There's no I.O. layer that automatically does normalization for you. Um, what? Why not? As well. Well, I, I actually, I have a module that does this, but it do, doesn't use I.O. layers. 
So I, I just use that. Um, if you read the whole file in, you could split on line, you know, could line break sequences. I, I just hate the whole character turn line beat paragraph. So just convert them all into single line, new lines, and it's a lot easier. Um, case insensitive matching is a remarkably non obvious thing in Unicode. First of all, Unicode has decided that it calls things letters that Caesar never would. So, for example, the Chinese ideograms, Chinese writing, are considered letters by Unicode. Um, and so, can anybody read either of those? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Yes, I'm. Yeah, that's Tokyo, but that's a Mojibaki, which means you screwed up your encoding. Um, <laughs> there are things that have, there are letters that don't have case. There are things that have case that are not letters. Um, you, you have cased letters that you can apply a case map to, and it doesn't change it. So they're like sticky. You know, they're lowercase and they're determined to stay that way, even if you call uppercase on them. Um, the superscripts and subscripts, um, the small caps, except for small cap R, which does have an uppercase map, but none of the others do. Um, the most important thing, though, is that there are no round trip guarantees. In ASCII, there's a round trip guarantee. If I have something, if I say, whatever you are, now you are lowercase. Oh, now you're uppercase. You can go back and forth. You'll get back the same thing that you used to have. If I have an uppercase letter, turn it to lowercase, turn uppercase again, I get the same one back again. Um, this is just not true in Unicode. I mean, it's not guaranteed. There are cases where it's not true. Um, case maps are may change in length. The uppercase version of a string may be more code points than the lowercase version of a string. Why? Oh, because for the lowercase, we had a pre-composed E with an accent. But for uppercase, we don't have a capital E with an accent. So that one we split up into a combining characters, stuff like that, and worse. There's, there's no case, there's no guarantee of length across being the same across case maps. Is there one reason that putting it all in NFD first is good and that won't change? No. <laughs> you still have the S set. The sharp S is a single code point, hex DF. I hate that I know that. Um, when you uppercase it, it's two cap S's. And you lowercase that, you get two lowercase S's. And that's just German way to write. Yeah. And there's the brief example you've got up on the screen there with the... Uh... Oh, I, I've got a... We're coming to that one. Yes. So, uh, Greek has... Modern Greek is not so bad. Polytonic Greek has lots of marks all over the place. Um, so this thing, which has got a, that's an alpha with a rough breathing mark and an iota subscript. That's a little I underneath the alpha. Chi or something. Well, when you uppercase that, <coughs> that little combining mark turned into capital iota. And so, which means it changed from a combining mark to a letter. It's very strange. Uh, so another surprise about Unicode is that there are three cases, four case maps, there are three cases, not just two. There's a lower case and an upper case, and there's a title case, which sometimes makes a difference. There is a title case letter, which is a capital alpha with a rough breathing mark, 
and an IOTA subscript. You would not you you would only use it if you were in mixed case text. So title case means the first letter is capital, everything else is lowercase. Um, if there were a Unicode code point that were a th, and you know you were using it for Thomas or the River River Thames. If you wanted it in a headline, you would need the title case version, so it were a big T and a little H. Oh. Another surprise. Uh, we Unicode tried very hard and almost succeeded in making case not be affected by your locale settings, or not need to be affected by your locale settings, I should say. There is an exception uh, with the Turkic languages. Um, we will, we'll see that as we go along. But for the most part, case doesn't care what language it's in. All right, so case insensitive matching happens when you say slash I. When you do a slash I, any of these should match any of the other ones. Um, and now, at long last, and I believe it actually does. Um, but you wouldn't want to write your all these OR expressions in your regex to match all possible upper, lower, or title case forms. So that's why we have a slash I. At long last, which version of Perl does actually It certainly works in um, 5.14, except for a, very, a couple of very small yeah, that, yeah, there's a couple of bugs. Um, I, yeah, but I think there's only one or two left in 16. That, okay, known bugs. So who knows how many unknown bugs there are? <laughs> Inversion? Oh. Yeah. So if you matched, um, if you wanted to match SS case insensitively, that should match an S set, a sharp S, right? Well, what happens if you say print S, close print, print S, close print, slash I, and you feed it in a sharp S? What does dollar one and dollar two hold? We have a problem. If you don't put the brackets in, it actually will work fine. If you put the brackets in, it changes what it matches. And I'm sorry, but I don't know the, I don't know the right solution. Um, Unicode technically def defines two kinds of case folding. One that ha case mapping, one that happens on a character by character basis, and one that makes sense for full strings. Character by character, that means if you apply a case map to a code point, you are guaranteed you get a code point of exactly the same length back. This is actually not very, it's useful only to computer programmers, not to people working with human languages. You get, much, you get better results when you have the string versions of the, of the mappings. Um, Perl supports the, 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 oh, we might change our length version of this, called full case. Um, these are simple. So post with a, the archaic long S or post without, those are case insensitive matches of each other. And that works even with simple case folding. With um, full case folding, it means that our sharp S can match a double S. The short story is if you say slash I, modulo bugs, it will just work and you don't have to think about this. There used to be a lot more bugs. 5.8, I wouldn't try full case mapping at all. Case folding. Uh, the, full the UC functions generally work except for the Unicode bug, but the slash I, I, I have no promises on. So, when you're doing a, a regex substitute, when you say 
uh, you know, match something and replace it by the right hand side is a double coded string. It's an interpolated string. And in that, you can put um, these old VI escapes. I know people, millions of people use VI and don't realize these work here. Um, backslash L is lowercase the next character. Backslash capital L is lowercase all the next characters until a backslash E. Um, backslash capital U means capitalize all the rest of them. Backslash little u title cases the next code point. And these actually compile into calls to the LC, UC first, or UC functions, or LC first in that case, sorry. In 5.16, we have a way of doing that for fold case. Fold case is like lowercase with a, some, some changes. And fold case is what is used when you say slash i. So if you wanted, you could use backslash capital F to get the fold case map of something. Um, or the FC function. If you're not running 5.16, and, and really almost no one is, you can get the FC function from the Unicode case fold module. You don't get the backslash capital F escape because source filters would be going too far. Ah, when you say slash I, only the pattern part is subject to case folding. Slash I doesn't apply to the right hand side. You laugh, but some people think it should. Okay, so uh, this is another part of the, we can't fix this problem. <coughs> so if you say masa with a sharp S, it does match masa without, with a regular S's. But what do you do here? Masa with a sharp S and then just MAS, you're not done yet. It's like half a code point. We don't match half code points. And that's kind of in, an, an unsolvable problem, right? Um, well, there's a workaround is you can force it into cap uppercase and then do your possible partial match. It's not pretty, it takes extra space and time, but I don't know how to solve the middle one. Uh, finally, Full case folding is suspended, I mean turned off, in when you're doing a character class that you've started with circumflex to invert it. And the reasons for that are way too complicated to get into here, but it, it leads to paradoxes. So it's actually turned off. Perl does not have locale sensitive case folding or case mapping built into it that's applied automatically for you. What does that mean? It means that if you have Sisyphus and put it all in lower case, you get the wrong sigma at the end. It doesn't know about that kind of sigma. Oh, and here's the other locale thing besides the sigmas. Uh, the Turkish eye problem. <coughs> They have a different rule for what happens when you upper and lowercase i's. There is a module, and you can't, I can't even see the bottom line of that. Sorry. They didn't warn me about the resolution. Um, there's a Unicode casing module, which has examples of how to address these. And let's see, I'm on slides, not a long ways from the end. And I have examples at the very end of these materials of using that particular um, thing, but I hope you don't have to deal with it. That's all I can say. Okay. When you're doing pattern matching with, yes, Carl? One of the statements, these people are laughing about all the existence. It's concerning paradoxes instead of rule setting. But a lot of these are historical. I mean, computers were invented using action, with an American sort of thing, and then other countries that speak other languages to come up with their own system that works. Um, 
The Turkey had its own rules for capitalization. And so that Greek final sigma, that's really just a glyph system. And some people, when they hand write T's, have or R's, when it's at the end of the word in English, I'm old enough to remember cursive writing. I mean, <laughs> people would do it differently. A T would look like this at the end. Um, that's just a glyph difference. It really shouldn't be a character difference. But because of the Greek typewriters and then following Greek typewriters, the Greek computers had these two different they characters. They had two different characters. And so Unicode had to have two different characters. And so now, really, what you should do with the sigma is on input, convert it into the, the normal middle one, and on output, when it's at the very end of a word, convert it back to the final. But you sh or you could have your browser do that, for example. Yeah. And, and it wouldn't. Sure. And the computer program shouldn't have to know that there is two different signals. But because of historical reasons, there are. And Unicode is stuck with that. And it's, the back. In Greek, you are too. Yeah, the backwards compatibility police are rabbit. Yes. I was just going to say, uh, you need to quickly see more text because the command line is. You know? I've been doing it, dude. Nothing. I know it works for me when I'm not plugged into this system. It, I don't understand. Well, that's just a Safari text thing. And I know. I know. It worked for him in his presentation this morning. Yeah. Hey, maybe you have a minimum font size set. Yeah. See that? See that? See that? It's grayed out. It won't let me do it. Isn't that a bummer? What if you check Zoom text? Do you really want to? I guess I can. Can you read that? I doubt it. I'm well, just saying you could do it case by case. <laughs> okay. Your character class shortcuts backslash W, backslash D, backslash S, backslash B. These and their complements. These work on Unicode. So backslash W is an elf and a munder, generally. There are lots of, there are several underscores. There are a, a surprising number of digits, and there are an astonishing number of letters in Unicode. Um, so when you say backslash W, you match over 100,000 different code points, po uh, possible code points. Um, even backslash D matches 420 different code points as of 6.0. I don't think it's changed to 6.1. Uh, backslash S, there are a bunch of different Unicode white space things. Question. Yes. Does Perl treat a string which is consisting of digits but not Latin? Sorry, are not these are our usual digits as an actual number if you use it in a numeric context or not? That, I, you know, that's an issue. You know, I don't like the text zoom only part. I'm going to have to go back. Yeah, so what does what does matching a number do if it's not regular digits? Um, what's that? That is matched by backslash D. Uh, a pung of bamboo or you know, a child of bamboo or a pung of red dragons is not matched by backslash D and probably isn't worth anything, or at least the child isn't. But these other ones, they have, these actually have numerical values in, but they're not digits, thank God. But backslash D will match these guys down here, which means you have an issue means that your backslash D plus can match things that if you turn around and try to use this number, it won't work. 
Um, so what do you do about that? You write out, you can do what Abigail does and be religious about writing 0-9 because that's all he wants. Um, you can, if you believe that writing POSIX digit is more obvious to the reader than 0-9, that you may write that. There is a new switch as of 5.14 um, that says, give me the ASCII sense of that backslash D. Or you can just take whatever you get and then run it through that function. Uh, and that's also new to 5.14. So for example, here's a Devanagari digit. Blah, 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 blah. So that will match there. If you try to say it's got a numeric value of percent D, Perl doesn't know how to convert those. So you, to convert a non-ASCII digit string into the base 10, or not base 10, you know what I mean. Convert it into a number. You can run it through there. That works. It works on digit strings, base 10 digits. It works on single code points that have a numeric sense. So Roman numeral 10 is numerically 10. Roman numeral 7 is numerically 7. But if you had XVII, it's not 17. Only the base 10 things are converted into as though they were base 10. Other than that, it's, it's code point by code point. But if you just do them one at a time, so match anything with a numeric value, any one code point with a numeric value, it will convert, give you those answers. Know your boundaries. Ah, yes. There may be three people in this room who know what these do, and I'm not sure if I'm one of them. Um, people are remarkably confused over what backslash B actually matches. Um, it doesn't match anything, it turns out. It's just an assertion. It's a zero with assertion. Um, these two are equivalent. Uh, I'll do the easier one. It says, if there's a, a boundary, is just like, if there is a word character behind me, then there must not be one in front of me. Or else, if this part is false, there must be one in front of me. This might be easier to read in this format, which is, if there's one behind me, there mustn't be one in front of me. Or if there's not one behind me, there mu must be one in front of me. Those are the same. Um, except what people really think backslash B means is it's the edge of the string or next to white space. That's, it's so common that's what people think it is. You can write that yourself, although it gets annoying because of the Uh, negative, the look behinds can't be variable width. So if a space boundary on the left says either, pretend I said backslash capital A there, sorry, uh, either the start of the string or there is Unicode white space behind me. But that's only an edge on the left. An edge on the other side is it's the end of the string or there's Unicode white space. That's usually what people mean by backslash B. Backslash B is defined in terms of backslash W. Backslash W is defined in terms of 102,787 different code points. It may, not, it may match more or less than what you want it to match. <sighs> Unicode has its own idea about text boundaries that is not related to whether it's a word character or not. Um, Perl's backslash B does not work that way. There is a module that implements the uh, particular Unicode document standard that 
says how that should work. Um, I don't use Unicode line break much. I have used it. I do use use uh, GCS string more often because it that means grapheme cluster string. Do I have examples of it? Who knows? Probably not so many because this is the regex talk. Carl, you know, I don't want to talk about these. Um, all right. So if you said use v.14, then Perl is going to try to map. It thinks everything's Unicode. If you haven't said that, it has all these weird rules that no one, no one can tell you what they are without having the source code that they keep looking at as they're explaining what's going on. I know. I probably can too, but not if I'm tired. It's, it's tricky stuff. Right, so slash A means only use ASCII rules, and slash double A means really, I meant it the first time. Um, don't use the dumb option, that slash D, that's the old default. It stands for stupid or dumb <laughs> or dodgy or, oh, it depends. We don't know. Uh, slash U means always treat things as Unicode. That's the default under use V.514. Actually, use V.5.12, except it doesn't work there. But if you say use V.5.12 and you're using 514, it will work. Uh, single A means use ASCII rules. However, it still uses Unicode case folding under slash I. Slash double A says no. So how many possible letters does A to Z match case insensitively? 26 times 2 is 52, right? If that's the answer you're looking for, you should be using double A. There is no triple A. Because um, under single A, it matches 54 code points, not 52. I... These are probably best used on a per scope basis. So under 5.14 or, or above, you can specify the regex flags on a per block, per scope basis. So you could say, and Damien likes to say, use RE slash MSX. That means all his regexes are MSXed without him having to write it every time. He thinks that's a cool feature. Um, Abigail, have you said use RE slash A before, or double A rather? No, cannot be thought of it. <laughs> the only uses are for use So internally, there are different tweaks for the character classes. So the only things that these change are the um, backslash W type things. If you say backslash P script equals Greek, that doesn't change. Okay. So the old style character classes and the way case insensitive matching is done, whether you get the Unicode rules or not. Um, you want it to act, you might just say use RE double A and it will act like it always used to in 1990. Unicode properties are cool. Um, there's a regex escape to get at them. So backslash P says match any code point with the property in the curly braces. Unicode properties have a name and a value. So they're pairs, uh, like script equals Greek. Uh, Perl has a bunch of shortcuts, so you don't have to use the two parters. You can just say, property Greek, and it actually means property script equals Greek, for example. 
The most commonly used ones probably are the general categories. Every code point belongs to exactly one general category. Um, and this is a fixed set. There will never be new general categories. Um, you could have a switch statement that said, if it's a letter, else if it's a mark, else if it's a number, etc. The one letter general categories do not need curly braces. Everybody else does. So the one letter ones are actually like wild cards that mean all the two letter properties beginning with that letter. So property letter means it's an uppercase or a lowercase, oops, upper, lower, title, modifier letter, other letter. Aren't you glad we don't have to write that? So instead of getting too nervous about the way backslash W works or backslash S or something, at the cost of one more letter, you can get more precision about what kind of things you're matching. So give me a letter, give me a number, give me a white space, et cetera. It's not checked. The separators is this one. So yes, all Unicode properties are two are have a key equal value. There are a bunch of shortcuts. Um, how do you find out what properties a code point has? How do you find out all the Unicode properties? There's a man page, Perl Uniprops, that lists all the properties that Perl recognizes. Um, it doesn't list each code point and what all its properties are. That's a different problem. Uh, for that, I wrote a program. So this computes the intersection of code points with the case property and code points with the number property. So these are case letters. And uh, you can get this from that URL or it's in a uh, CPAN bundle called Unicode, Unicode double colon T-U-S-S-L-E. Um, so you... I do this to inspect, you know, what possible code points are mapped by those properties. I have another program there which says, given a code point, what are all of its properties? And um, so that's the answer to that question. How do you find out all the all the properties of a, of a different of a particular code point? You run through all possible co properties and test. That's all I'm doing. You know, Carl, I'm really looking forward to never having to explain this part again. Because as soon as we can do character class set operations, we don't have to think about this. Okay, so you can define your own properties in Perl regexes. Um, so what I've done here is I've created a subroutine called isVolume. And here's one called is constant. And now I'll, once I find these, I can use backslash p is vowel or backslash p is constant. And the way this works is the function is expected to return a string, which is new line terminated, one code point per line, or a tab separated pair of code points for a range. And it should start with the word is or in. Well, then put the first document value from the document. Would you say that again? Every day? I'm sorry. I said that's what the document value says, but in practice it's not to one less than what's expected. It was broken recently. <laughs> we are using the same word for the same, different words for the same phenomenon. Okay. I've certainly abused the fact that it was possible. Yes, and so has Damien. He was very, he was 
saddened by this fix. Yes, you can even create your own long letter problem. <laughs> but they're not case sensitive. Did you know that? Have you ever tried backslash P little L? It works just fine. Yeah. But these. But, but, and, and, and if you have long use defined properties, which are named from schools in, in white space and more characters that are being named in white space, you cannot go with the user defined properties. Right, with user defined ones, the rules are different. So, property names in the Unicode properties, backslash P, Charlie Base, whatever goes in there, uh, case and white space are ignored and dashes. dashes. Uh, no, hyphen line instead, yes. Um, but not here. These have to be the exact ones. One interesting thing you can do with this, do I explain this? Yes, is you can do set operations. So here is an is Greco Roman. An is Greco Roman I define to be all the um, Latin script and all the Greek script. Code points, so you add, can add them together. And there's also an intersection with an ampersand. Um, and we are working to come up with a better way of specifying this. So it's not so you can find your own input properties, <coughs> do set, set operations combining the classes. Because if you can't do this, you have to write stuff like this all the time. It'll drive you nuts. So, here, um, here's a range that says it's all the code point is a Latin or a Greek or a common or an inherited. And you will not want to write that very often. Okay, good. I have 45 minutes left to complain. So the rest of the talk is just complain about things that will drive you nuts. So we, we picked up a lot of habits in ASCII um, land that are difficult to break when we come to Unicode. But if we don't break them, we will do things incorrectly. So have you ever seen code that does that? See that TR at the top? It says translate octo Characters 0 through 127, characters 128 to 255. What does that do? It turns out the high bit. Well, in ASCII, you don't care because you don't need a high bit. You don't want to do that in Unicode because we, just don't, we use those high bit characters. We use everything. It turns out that Perl actually uses more characters than Unicode uses. I can't. So the Unicode range, so, so to convert the ASCII approach to the Unicode approach, instead of doing that TR, you can do that TR. So take all the Unicode range and move them all the way up to really big code point numbers. Why would you want to do that? Well, if you've ever done the first one, you'll know why you might want to do it. You might like mark things as having been processed so they never match again. The problem with these non-Unicode code points is they're not legal Unicode. So uh, conformant processes will not respect them. You can't even encode them in UTF-8 according to the Unicode spec. Perl does. You can do that. So cooperating Perl processes, it's fine to do this. Other regex gotchas. I mentioned this backslash W matches over 100,000 things. You can use slash A or true again. Get rid of that. Um, I have so many times seen code that thinks it can convert to ASCII by simply removing accent marks. Um, yes? Uh, I had a question about the first one. Yeah. Like Unicode, I believe Unicode also provides a section that says it can be user defined. Is that inside or outside the 10 Gloria? Uh, the question is, 
what a, doesn't Unicode have something about users find something? Yes, it does. Um, there are private use area code points that are put to various uses. Apple uses one of them for its logo, but there's some Eastern languages, there's always been a tradition in their encoding systems of being able to just use things for whatever you want. And the Unicode is called private use. Those are all under 11 big thousand. Yeah, so they are within the Unicode range. They are defined code points. Okay. Uh, they don't have names. Um, yeah, you can't strip. Stripping, stripping accent marks does not mean you get ASCII in return. What if you had a sharp S? There's no accent mark on a sharp S. Um, there is a Unicode property called diacritic. It's not quite the same as the bark property. Um, there are a few things that one has and the other doesn't, and vice versa. Uh, let's see. Any, if a code point has the mark property, then it, it's print width is zero, right? Well, no, not always. <clears throat> but if I say a combining tilde, it's on the same character. Yes, in that case, if there's a letter before that, but if there's a new line before that, what are you supposed to do? Uh, also, there are spacing marks. There are, you think of combining marks as non-spacing marks. In, there are Eastern languages where there are actually marks that take up a print, print width. Um, there are all these degenerate cases. Uh, there's no limit to the number of combining characters you can stack on top of a base character. Um, there's, there's some UTS, uh, uh, Unicode uh, auxiliary document, that gives suggestions for normalization of names and stuff. Not, not NFD, but like uni, the, you, how to use Unicode like in domain names, stuff like that. And, and they give, they give um, suggestions to that you probably, it was either like 14 or 28 combining characters, probably is enough for this very limited application. But in general, there is no limit to how many combining characters you can have. Um, backslash X can contain more than one code point, and yet none of them are marks. The obvious example is character and line feed. There are actually others. Um, you have math, there are math characters you can't see. There's invisible times and invisible plus. And there's another one. The first kinds of Unicode property support supported Unicode blocks only, not Unicode scripts. Um, these are different things. So the Greek block has things in it that are Greek characters, that are from the Greek script. It also has things that are used in common with other scripts. So they are not technically of, of the Greek script type. They are uh, script type other. And also there are many blocks that have unassigned code points in them, you know, room for expansion. We may find some ancient Etruscan manuscript and have to add letters to it. ASCII has a different idea of what punctuation is than Unicode has. Um, and if you use the, um, in a regex, if you use bracket, colon, punct, colon, bracket, so you say, give me the POSIX punctuation property, it matches Unicode punctuation and ASCII symbols. 
So POSIX punctuation includes ASCII symbols. There's no umlaut character in E with a deresis. Um, there are all kinds of different dashes and hyphens um, in Unicode. The most commonly used non-ASCII code point in this huge collection that I examined, which is uh, the PubMed Open Access Collection, the most commonly used not asking code point was an n dash. The top five were n dash, not uh, hex a zero, non non breaking space, plus minus. It was all it was all punctuation essentially. Um, so instead of using a minus to match a minus. You probably ought to say match something with the dash property because who knows how they encoded it, which one they used. Oh, and this is even more complaints, more gotchas. So um, every time you open foo.txt and do not specify an encoding, you have created a problem. There's no such thing as a plain text file anymore. All there is is text files in some encoding. Because I promise you, every text file has an encoding. Well, why should I have to specify it? It should just be a default one. You can establish a default and say use open and set it so you know what the default is. But you can't read you can't read bits if you don't know what bits you got. Um, I hate platform specific encodings. Um, at least on Wikipedia pages, it turns out that it takes more space to encode things in UTF-16 than UTF-8, even Chinese or Japanese. Why would that be? Because it's in HTML. HTML is in ASCII. Well, if you properly encode it, you can mark it as UTF-8, but... No, no. I'm saying if you can... So there's this idea that, oh, if it's Japanese text, if you use UTF-16, it will be smaller than if you use UTF-8. Not in a web page, because a web page has so much markup, and that's in ASCII. Um, Perl doesn't actually use UTF-8 internally. It uses this hybrid thing Larry made that it's not quite UTF-8. What should you, what happens when there's an encoding error? Usually nothing, always nothing good, but usually nothing at all. Which if you analyze the logic, you will realize I've said that doing nothing at all is not a good thing. Um, I say use UTF-8, I use, say, use open with the right UTF-8 mumble, and then I say use warnings, fatal UTF-8. I want to know about encoding errors. Um, I want to know about them so intensely that I want to be shot dead if I don't trap the exception. Yes? Do you have a recommendation for a tool to say, if you're just given the file and you don't know what's encoding, to scan it and then to try to get a tool or a module? Um, I, I have anti-recommendations. <laughs> the ones out there don't work. I wrote one that worked. I wrote one that is 98% accurate on the corpus it was trained on, but it should be right. Um, or at least I can narrow it down and say which ones is not or whether. Okay. Between UTF-8, UTF-16, UTF-32, I think that one you can figure out. I mean, I mean, I mean. 
Um, the problem is the 8-bit encodings. And there is no right answer that does not use machine learning intelligence. And I put the module out there that does this, and I have spaced its name. It's on something. Anyway, I trained it on a, a several immense corpora of English language text. So it knows about the distribution of code points in English. And it just it, it just scores your text according to, well, here's its score if it's in Mac Roman. Here's its score in CB1252. Here's its score of this. And then whichever one comes up on top is its best guess. And again, it's 98% accurate on English text. But if you're getting stuff that's not in English, it's crap. And I forget its name. Encode Guess Educated? Yep, Encode Guess Educated. And it's like an alpha release because I, I, I didn't document it. It does work and it passes its tests, but it's not documented. Uh, it's a hard, it's, a, it's an insoluble problem in the general case. It can be addressed if you have a small enough domain, like just English. Because otherwise, basically, you have to determine what the text actually says, like how you know if it's an Icelandic versus, you know, you have to, you know, it's an Icelandic, so you can't use I2859R1 because it doesn't support Icelandic, and you have to basically depend on the text and read it and understand the distribution in every language on the planet, which is Oh, no, Google thinks they can do it. <laughs> but they have access to a larger corpus than I do. Um, yes, code points. There are code points above Unicode. Other silly things. You cannot set dollar slash to, be, to something that works for Unicode correctly. Because dollar slash is a literal. It's not a regex. So you can't set it to backslash cap R. Is backslash cap R is not an escape that means a particular character. It's a set of characters. It's more than a set of characters. It's either a two character graphing or it's one of a set of characters. So you can't set dollar slash. Can't do round tripping on casing because, right, the sigmas. If you, that, if you uppercase a middle sigma or a final sigma, you both you get a capital sigma. But if you lowercase that, you it doesn't know which one to give you back. Um, not every lowercase code point has a corresponding uppercase one, or vice versa, to go with it. Carl, I think they actually changed this in 6.2. I think they changed these and made these uh, LM or LO or something. Oh, no, they already are. Oh, no, that's it. They are LM. The problem is, they were also marked other lower case. Um, yeah. So these things are case letters, and they case map to themselves, no matter what case map you use. If you say back P lower, that, map, that does not match lowercase letters. I mean, it does match lowercase letters, but it matches more than that. So back P lower is the this is a Huffman encoding win. So the short thing is the thing you usually want to use. It turns out that lowercase letter is not the thing you usually want to use. You want to use lowercase. More anti-patterns. Uh, right. So don't assume, so changing the case can change the length of the string. This is a little unichar's um, invocation that finds things that change. Uh, other broken stuff. There's more than two cases, three cases in Unicode. Um, there are non-letters that have case. <laughs> there are case, there are case things that don't change case. And this is the, this is the annoying thing. There's some kinds of locale issues if you're in Turkey or Greece that you may want to think about with casing that is not covered by default. Mm -hmm. 
Lithuania too? I didn't know that. What's it do? Uh, of course. No, it's complicated. Who would have guessed? You're not talking about the um, legacy title case stuff, are you? Okay, I was. Different rules. Okay. So, small caps are in lowercase. A small, a ca small capital A is a lowercase letter. Its name is small capital, Latin small capital. I guess some of these are historical reasons. That's the only reason this title This is the easiest way to find out all the code points for a particular. So Unichar's property dash will tell us that there are bunches of them. Uh, yes, this is only regex talk, not general Unicode. If it were general Unicode, I would talk to you about print columns. In Asian character, with, with um, CJK, often you've got wide characters. Um, and sometimes you've got sometimes wide characters, either, which is Asia, East Asian width equals ambiguous, <laughs> where it depends on what it's around. Because they'll use, they'll use our symbols, but when it's our ASCII symbols or, or regular symbols in the middle of wide text, those symbols need to be wide too, so it takes up the same number of print columns. That's, that's an ugly problem. Uh, Unicode GCS string addresses that. It's never assume that characters that look alike are alike. Never assume that characters that do not look alike don't act the same. Sometimes they do. There's no limit to the number of characters in backslash X. Oh, backslash X can start with a combining mark. The file might start with a combining mark. What are you going to do? Or the line might. Ah. <sighs> What's hex for apps? Anybody know? Is it a character? Wasn't that something that was only appears in like UTF 16 but isn't a valid character? Well, that's a different problem. It is an unassigned non-character code point. It is not legal for open interchange, but it is, it is a Unicode code point. It has no name. You're thinking of you know, the UTF-8 byte order markers, bombs. Yeah. That's not what I was thinking of. Oh. <laughs> the, the surrogate code points? Yeah, that's what I was thinking of. There, that's a byte order mark. Um, in the wrong order. Surrogates, those are like, you see, you're not supposed to find these in UTF-8 streams. It's, if you find them in a UTF-8 stream, it is not a legal UTF-8 stream. Most of the, there are a lot of those out there. It's called CSU-8, -C -E where they take uh, something above the basic multilingual plane so it takes more than four hex digits, right? And they split it into the two UTF-8-16 surrogates, and then they encode both of those as UTF-8. This is not legal UTF-8. It happens a lot, though. Uh, that's... Does that raise an exception if you have uh, use uh, warnings? YouTube? Oh, did you say use warnings? 
fatal UTFA thing? Yes, it does. Did you forget to say that? Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> How? No. What behavior? What kind of fix? Yeah, what kind of fix? What's the right thing to do? For a surrogate or the It should. I don't know what. Sorry. Um, I don't know why there are so many slides left. I think I was complaining a lot. Um, so this is the CZU8 problem. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. Look at this. 12 is less than 345 is less than 6789. That's a literal string. If you print it out, sometimes... It doesn't look like that. That's a right to left embedding. And now my 12 less than 345 is a 345 is greater than 12, which is still true, you'll note. <laughs> um, and th th then there's right to left overload, override, which does something different again. So your literal strings, so bidirectional text has weird stuff going with it. Yes? What, what the answer about the use script UTF-8 stuff, what the circuits? The, the code that's being worked on, where you get, you're reading your UTF-8 and you've got a string there, it's got options. So when you open that file, you can tell, this answer's not really satisfying to anybody. Um, <laughs> it, it can, you can tell it, I want, I want to read a file, it's UTF-8, and then you can turn on loose or strict, which either allows or disallows individually surrogates, non-characters, and non-shortest forms. But my inspection of the code, I'm not finding what the default value is. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it lets you pick what you think the right thing is. I'm just looking for interesting things. Um, oh, don't do ranges. Don't do square bracket. So I have ice remember, square bracket character classes, where you say like A dash Z, don't do, pick some random Unicode code point dash, some other random Unicode code point, and think you're going to get anything sane happening. So, right. So people will write uh, capital A dash little Z in square brackets. And they say, well, that'll get all the upper and lowercase ASCII letters. And Yes, it will. You also get six other things that are punctuation marks. So, you know, it, there are 24 letters in the Greek alphabet. So if I say alpha dash omega, how many letters do I get? Didn't I just tell you there are 24 letters? And alpha and omega, that's the beginning again, right? So there should be 24. It's just not the way it's laid out. And those are the easy ones. You ought to see Cyrillic. No, you can do it on the modern Cyrillic Avis. Later, I can't remember the last Yeah, I don't know what it's saying. Oh, it's probably the, the HDO. But you can do that. 
for modern civility. So you can see. But you're missing the code points that are used only in Ukrainian corporate. That's that's the problem. Yes. Uh, yeah, there are many variants on Cyrillic. You're probably it probably works for Russian. Yeah. Well, there's more things that use Cyrillic than Russian. That's not what they taught me in Russian. <laughs> <laughs> they when you took Russian, there was no such place as the Ukraine. There was That's right. another place of the Soviet Union. Oh yes, I, I was just complaining too much. You know, so what I wanted to do is there's a couple of other things that aren't regex related, but they are Unicode things. And I can't and I this thing. Okay, so. Yes, question, where? Here. Yes, please. Um, I didn't hear any I didn't hear any mention of uh, say NFKB, for example. I wondered if if you wanted to do sort of uh, fuzzy mapping, like whether pulling things into NFKB may make something simple. You can do that in Okay, I only missed a few minutes. Um, that was the very beginning of the talk. Um, it may make sense to use compatibility decomposition, um, especially for searching. Okay, so you did mention it. Okay. And uh, Adobe Reader does. Adobe Reader, you can find things that are only compatibility matches. So they obviously do that in search too. Otherwise, how do you search for something in small caps? I mean, you specify the exact book name for it. It's not fun. So, I actually get, see, I proposed two different talks. And this is another talk, and I did give this at OSCON. And here I talk about. And there, there's a URL for this talk if you wanted that. It's from OSCON 211. Um, and I wanted to. Go to some of the cool stuff. Ah, yes. So here I explain in a little bit more clearly how, why you should start your programs in certain ways. Where you want to deal with Unicode. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So first you want to say, I would say at least use 5.12, if not 5.14. Things start to get sane by then. Then you declare the source unit as UTF-8, which means you say use UTF-8. Uh, turn on strict, turn on warnings, and turn on fatal UTF-8. Um, you may want to turn off certain kinds of sub warnings. So in 5.14, the UTF-8 warning class has three subclasses called non-char, surrogate, and non-unicode. Do I explain what those each are? No, great. So non-character, there are 66 unicode code points that are never that are specifically called non-character code points, like FFFF. You will get a warning if you encounter them in UTF-8 stream. And of course, if you're fatalizing those, it'll kill you. So you might say, I want you know fatal things with UTF-8 because I've got encoding errors or something. But if I get a non-character code point, maybe I want to let that one slip by. So you could say no warnings, non-char. Surrogates should not be in UTF-8 stream, so that one is on by default. Non-unicode means above hex 10FFFM. So sometimes you'll turn want to turn some of those off. <sighs> Declare a default encoding. That's for the whole program, not it's not just um, what is scope. That's what I'm use open is the current scope. It is lexically scoped, right? I think that uh, open is for the, the current scope, but CS is for the current script. Right. So if you say Perl dash capital CS, 
or set env per unicode so the environment variable and command line flags are for the whole program but use open is scoped um i also put a use char names in everything now get this is weird even with use open or your Perl Unicode variable or Perl dash capital CS, none of those do anything to data. So if you want UTF-8 in your data, you have to <coughs> um, bin mode it. What does that all together look like? It looks like this. Uh, don't take the Palm Bang line too seriously. Replace it with whatever you guys need to do for your system. So if you're going to write a Unicode program, you might want to put this kind of thing at the top of it, <coughs> kind of a standard template. Uh, under 5.16, you get full and short chartings for free. Me. Yes? Didn't you say that auto didn't work with use open? That's right. I test my return code. True. I should have mentioned that again. Use open and use auto die do not play well together. Um, which one would you rather have? You have to pick one. I, I asked why we, it, it, it was suggested to me that that cannot be fixed. I don't know why. Some other things you'll often want are use Unicode normalize, pull in NFD and NFC, maybe the other two. Uh, sometimes you'll need encode and decode, but not very often. Usually you should set the encoding on the stream. If you need to call encode decode on particular pieces of data, uh, I mean, sometimes this happens like with DBM files or with database files. It comes to you encoding. You have to decode it. But if it's a stream and the stream is all the same encoding, just set it once and for all on that stream. Don't manually encode and decode every piece the same way. Because if you ever forget to do one of them right, then it won't be right. What's this last line for? Why did I put that in my standard template? Because it's connected to the pager, that's right. <laughs> um, if you were, in fact, if you were using auto die, of course that doesn't work with open, then that would catch other things too. Like you, you that's annoying with the pager because you'll get the pipe close failure. Oh, look at this. Have you ever tried saying use warnings fatal all in your program? Doesn't work very well. Well, okay. Have you ever had a compile time warning? It will kill your compiler. Not only does it kill the compiler, you'll never know why. Because it causes a cascade of errors. And so you really can't do fatal warnings at compile time. You must not. It, it messes things up. The compiler is set up, if it's going to give you a warning instead of an error, it wants to keep going. And you will not learn what really caused it. Because the first warning may not be the one you need to see. But the first warning is the one that kills you. So you can set up, set up a SIG die handler to do a stack backtrace at runtime. And you can do it with warnings too. Now that fatalizes warnings at runtime instead of at compile time. I wish there were a way to say use warnings deferred or something. So wait until the unit check has, do, has done, until it's done compiling. And this is a workaround. Dollar here it is. All right, so this, and this is what I do with my normal little Unix filters. So I say, if I didn't get any arguments and standard in is a terminal and standard error is, then remind the guy that he's supposed to be typing. And then I do my filter thing. When I do the filter, I normalize to decomposition on the way in. I normalize to composition on the way out. 
So if you get, get this version of the slides, you can pull these and this is just kind of a template that I keep sitting around when I want to write a, uh, a Unicode aware filter. I just plug in this template. Uh, this is from the Perl Run Man page. It tells you what your Perl uh, Unicode environment variable can be set to. Um, I, I think I'm the only one who ever uses this. I don't think other people use this. I run with mine set to SA in my login script. I export Perl Unicode equals SA. Don't use the D. You'll be very sad. <laughs> if you say SAD, then you have now set the default encoding on disk files. Um, and Pro code that ex Unix programs, see if a Windows programmer wouldn't have screwed this up because he's used to having to bin mode things. But a Unix programmer is expecting that if he doesn't mark the encoding, it's a binary file and he can get bytes. The, if you set the D flag, it'll screw that up. We tried that once. It doesn't work. Yes. And that was all the easy stuff. And there were 40, we, I won't do it. There were 40 more slides in that talk, and that's all hard stuff. Unicode, but we don't do. Char names pra pragma. I like the char names pragma because I want to use backslash n. Backslash capital N so you can name the character. Um, I almost never use the the script names. I usually use full or short. But you can say, give me all the Cyrillic and Greek names. And then you can just say backslash n sigma. You don't have to say Greek capital letter, whatever. You can make your own char names. So not only can you make your own properties for regexes, you can make your own character, um, named characters. And the reason this is useful is because, well, for one thing, it might be too long to type. But for another thing that's important, there are characters that have no names. The private use characters have no names. Um, if you do not name your characters, now you've got magic numbers in your code. That's, that makes it hard to maintain. So one of the ones I use is um, the Apple logo. So use char names with an alias of Apple logo goes to, or whatever it is, F something. F8, FF. -F. So it's nice to... Invent your own names for properties and characters. In fact, you can actually chart out your whole, your own private use area block and just define properties and everything for it and character names. I did that with the proposed Tenguar block for Tolkien. And I defined Tenguar properties and character names, which works fine, almost. It doesn't play nicely with backslash W. Right, so it doesn't, it's a private use California. It doesn't suddenly become also an alphabetic just because you've done these games, but that's okay. Um, this is the end of my time. Any questions? Um, yes. One comment uh, earlier in your talk, you mentioned that with uh, Unicode Collate, if you want to ignore uh, your diacritics, uh, use level one, but you have to ignore paste as well. But I wanted to mention yes. that there's the attribute uh, ignore level two that you can uh, set to a true value, and it will uh, then you can use whatever level you'd like. It will just ignore. Wait, level wait, wait. Two. Is this new? They I, keep. I don't know when it was added, but they, I know they keep adding new things to the. That that's not right anymore. The uh, this is the list of your collator. Um, Arguments, and I just looked on the, I did a update, and they added a bunch of new ones. Yeah, so it, it could be new. I know that I, I've got it with. Uh, so you've been able to ignore accents, but still have case. Right. Obviously, it's something they needed. Yeah, so it's called ignore underscore level two. Uh. Yep, there it is.
Yeah, if it's a new one. Uh, I have to send you out so other people can, can come in here. So sorry. So you can get the thing you said you couldn't get. Yes, you didn't get the thing I thought you could not get. Because you used to not be able to get it. Again, these, uh, this, partic this other slide set is at a different place. This, this second set was from o OzCon 2011. Thanks, Alan. Okay.